close, but not so close for a time. You can share from a distance for a time. You know we want to see each other. You'll have to stay in your golden time space while we talk. Quarantine, April 2nd, 2021. Uh, this is our 63rd show, and evidently we're into the second year. And if you've been following the show, you know we started about a year and a week ago when it became clear to everyone that we were going to be having to dodge out at home and be in a quarantine. And the show got started because all of us, Mickey and I, we were lonely. It's like there'll be no one to talk to. And we also saw that there was all this innovation going on under the surface. And one of the themes we've been following all year long has been this extension of the virtual, how sound, how the arts, how screens have evolved because we've been living virtually. And today's show, we're going to have a lot of fun getting into a very important phenomenon of this, the, the growth of crypto art, non-fungible tokens, mechanisms uh, that have gotten a lot of attention recently that merge some of the DNA of art, some of the DNA of money, uh, and change the nature of how we collect things. And we're going to have uh, a deep dive into the visual side of that, the nonprofit side of that, the music side of that, and what tokenomics is all about. But to start off with, I thought we'd go back and have a little bit of a primer. Uh, we're going to show you Quarantine News to take a look at what's the history of changes in art. And how did we get here? And um, that's you. This is Quarantine News, 1879. Louis Daguerre popularizes photography. The public is delighted, except for the French avant-garde, pissed off, led by Charles Baudelaire, the bad boy of French literature, who, upon seeing this new technology of photography, declares, if photography is allowed to supplement art and some of its functions, it will soon have supplemented or corrupted it altogether. April 29th, 1874, Claude Monet launches Impressionism, and it gathers its first reviews. This school does away with two things, the line, without which it's impossible to reproduce any form, and color, which gives the form the appearance of reality. Wait, is this even an impression? 1950, Ben Leposky invents computer art. He brings together light and realizes for the first time that the undulating light of an oscilloscope can be used to create basic rhythmic designs, oscillons, which may change art and everything. Okay, it wasn't computer art at all. It was a damn analog machine, but still, time marches on. 1968, the first true computer art show, Cybernetic Serendipity, opens in London. Entirely new ideas come out. Art gets meta. Tingley invents metamatic machines to engage the audience, which becomes mesmerized. And the professional view reviewers say, uh, well, wait, th this exhibition serves to show up a desolation to be seen in art that we've never seen. We haven't the faintest idea these days what is for or about when it comes to art. Over the next 50 years, computer-mediated art becomes serious. It develops an audience, a following, museums collected. It comments on the great ideas of the day, technology, isolation, how we react to machines. And as all of this moves forwards, man and art form a bond until last month and the launch of the non-fungible token. Suddenly, an entirely new culture invades the art world. New values, new value creation, new collectors, new artists, and a new sensibility. What does it all mean? How will it resolve? Fortunately, we have quarantine news because something's happening and we're just the guys to find out.
Okay. A couple hundred years of the history of art, because every time there's something new, someone sees this disruption. Disruption is a little bit annoying. Uh, hey, Mick, welcome. Hey, Peter. I just also don't think you can help yourself. You have to. You have to like dig into the into the archives. And I By mean, way, it's part of the fun of this is that is to see these echoes of the past showing up in different ways. You know, Mark Twain said. History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And I think we're, we're, we're seeing all sorts of weird rhymes. Um, you know, I learned about an economic bubble from, uh, let's see, Neil Stevenson, The Confusion, which talks about uh, a bubble in Holland in the 1600s when people were speculating on tulips, these new kinds of beautiful flowers, and they were trying to get to a black tulip. And it only turned out much later that we learned that a black tulip was caused by a fungus that actually infected the tulips. And, but, the, but people were walking down the street, like talking about tulip futures and, and things until suddenly the crash. And, and this was when the Dutch Republic was really one of the biggest powerhouses for economics in the world. Later, Isaac Newton decides to actually join the Bank of England and took over the Bank of England to recoin the mint so that he could actually you know, help figure out how to make liquid currency. And today now we're talking about all sorts of new kinds of liquidity and fungibility and, and things like that. It's, it's odd to me too that we've got this term that you normally only hear about if you're an accountant, fungibility, or maybe a CFO, that now people seem to be talking about. You know, How do you <laughs> funge things between one thing and another and how is something non-fungible? And part of it's what we look, want to look at is how in, in the world of crypto, uh, this pandemic, which as, you, which as we've seen, have turned people more into collectors, have had more screen time. There is something that's gone on this last year that has kind of set us onto an interesting trajectory. Uh, we've got a great group today. So I thought what we do first is just introduce everybody. And then we would dive into some of the background stuff. So joining us. So today, we'll introduce everybody and we'll sort of push them back into the green room and then we'll we'll kind of yeah. bring in pairs maybe and, yeah. and kind of go so about it. Yep. For the first part of the show, let's let's meet uh, uh, John, our friend John Clippinger. Uh, hello. Hello. Hey, and John. Chris. Oh, hey, Chris. And and John has been with us before. Hey, Chris. John and I worked on a book a few years ago from Bitcoin to Burning Man and beyond. So we've been looking at some of these tokenomic effects. John teaches at MIT, has been to us into this for a long time. And Chris, you've run the World Tokenomic Forum, and we collaborated on a number of projects. You're very much up on what's going on these days. It was it was fun. We we had some fun in South by 2018, and Mr. Clipperger and Mickey and you, everybody. It was great. It's good to reconnect. So, so then on our next pod today, I want you to meet Sarah Stevens. Oh. And uh, do we have Jesse on the line? There's Jesse Kirschbaum. Okay. A very interesting component hey, of NFTs are NFTs and sound. Sarah, you've been doing work in spatial audio as an artist. And Jesse, uh, you have been doing work with your musicians, introducing them to the space. And uh, so that will be the second pod. And then, of course, visual arts and NFT. Steve Sachs runs Bitforms, which is uh, one of the top digital art galleries. You've been had artists in this. You've pioneered this space. And joining us also, Martin Weinstein, who leads a carbon nonprofit. And you were part of this very successful carbon drop recently, where because of some of the um, energy properties or carbon properties of, of, of crypto, <clears throat> Artists got together with you and have looked at a whole new nonprofit environment. So here's who we have today. Here's our lineup. We're going to mostly push everyone back into the green room, but we're going to keep John and Chris and, and jump in on getting an overview uh, uh, first to get a, to get a sense of things. Um, actually, I want to open it up to Chris first. Chris, you know, I met you um, at South by, and then you ended up hosting the very first world tokenomic forum. And I just thought, what the heck is a tokenomic forum? What the heck is a token? What what is this stuff? Can you give us a little bit of your background and and or or background on on kind of that world? Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, um, guys, first, it's an honor to be on the show. Um, I remember when the first episode happened, and I pinged you, Mickey, and I was like, "That's awesome! I can't wait to watch this every week." So it's awesome to be here, especially at this time. I think I think this is a perfect use case of what's happened in the last couple of weeks with NFTs. But um, you know, Churchill said, "The further you look backwards, the farther you can see ahead." I've, I've always liked that quote. I think Peter, your intro 
just reminded us of that. And, you know, the World Tokenomic Forum was kind of this thing um, that was like this space and place that we created back in 2017 when the ICO bubble was starting to take off. Um, and, and the intent was that that this is the next version of a market economy. And um, currencies aren't real, but tokens are, right? Tokens are nothing more than containers of value. And we have different kinds of tokens. And we'll talk about that, I'm sure, a lot today. But this notion that you can arbitrage bits and atoms and physical and metaverses and everything in between um, lends itself to these really interesting uses of technology to do things that you can't do without it. And, um, and so when we were looking at 2017, after years in technology and 20 some odd years of being an entrepreneur, it was apparent that uh, there was going to be a lot of spaghetti on the wall. There was the pirate ships dodging islands and getting rich on Bitcoin and scamming everybody and evading the law. And then there was the, you know, central banks that were going to resist it at all costs and, and ban stuff and do whatever. And so we just thought, you know, there's a debate that's going to happen. There's a discourse that's going to happen and we can hold a place in space for that. And we can meet some interesting people and then we'll figure out how to take our investments, our business forward based on that. So that was really the genesis of it. It, it was this notion that if you want to seat at the table, bring the table and, um, and try and invite people from all parties to it and see what good can come out of this. Cause at the end of the day, whether we like it or not, some are going to get richer, some are going to get poorer, poorer. But the reality is, is 8 billion of us are going to be living in the middle. And last time I checked, nobody wants to be in a $20 million penthouse surrounded by AK-47s. And so, you know, it really came out of just a pragmatic approach to trying to create a discourse that, um, uh, you know, plays on what we look back historically, which is hate and Ashbury comes before Silicon Valley, right? Social cultural revolutions have always, always since... The history of man, uh, you know, predated technology scale of, of some sort or innovation. Like um, geeks follow culture, uh, for, for lack of a better word, even if they build the stuff first. So, um, so Chris, one of the things that was interesting was, you know, the, the, obviously the World Tokenomic Forum was sort of a riff on the World Economic Forum, which was about a bunch of central banks and a bunch of big power players that go to exactly what you just said, which is sort of the big wigs who have, who have created this kind of bifurcation between the rich and the poor. And are, and are sort of sequestered away and they get together in shadowy kind of Bilderberg rooms and they decide what the world will be, you know, and they, they do that. And one of the things that started happening with the rise of these cryptocurrencies was people started going right around the edges. There was no central bank. It was all, it was all over the place. And it was kind of the edges were starting to be infected. What do you see right now? I know you're working on, uh, you know, some, some initiatives now that have to do with sort of the startup ecosystem and and new platforms. What do you see right now that you're you're excited by, that you actually well, think we should know yeah. about? Yeah. <clears throat> so you know, at World Tokenomic Forum is kind of like this uh, philanthropic kind of social impact side of what we do. SDK is is our company, and and what we're focused on is and what we're excited about is the fact that you know we're 12 years into a post Satoshi white paper world. Um, we're 1999. And Satoshi was the person, the shadowy figure that that came up with the methodology for for blockchain. Yeah, we are crazy. 11 years into after Satoshi wrote a white paper suggesting uh, that there was this mechanism. John, you and I started focusing hmm. on this. You and I worked on a book probably six years ago of this From Bitcoin to Burning Man book. And then you and I were both at the 75th anniversary of the invention of the Monetary fund, which was, of course, the our, our, mm. our, our the, the the history right. well, of fiat, right. and you've been looking at the connection between mm. both social movements and the fact that moving towards new economic systems have everything to do with the evolution of societies for a few years. How would you set up both kind of the trajectory of the last couple of years and why this last year is particularly special? Well, I, I think. Uh... Let me sort of roll back. I, I, I think that what, what Bitcoin represented was you had the, the collapse in 2008. You had a, a um, the, 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 the lack of faith in the, a, the central bank, in, in government itself. Mm. You're looking for new forms of authorities that you could trust that weren't corrupted mm. and captured. And so the idea that you can have a fully distributed autonomous uh, authority, no third party, that it can be uh, a, done by math and algorithm uh, represented a real breakthrough. So you didn't have to trust the, 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 
the the, the elites in in the back rooms in Wall Street or the, mm -hmm. the central banks who the whole narrative is that they were manipulating the markets, they were inflating the currency. It was a mm -hmm. captured system. So there, it, it, behind that uh, was a notion that we're creating new kinds of dist distributed, decentralized institutions. That they're algorithmic. Um, that the third party does not. That the basically blockchain was taking away the third party. It had a very highly uh, sort of libertarian strain to it, um, and in the sense is okay, we don't want to deal with governments, and 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 we don't have to deal with governments, and we can create our issue or our token. That was sort of the the Bitcoin narrative, and then then I think I'll never forget when uh, I saw this uh, video of uh, this nineteen year old skinny kid in front of a white background and uh, and and, and Buterin, uh, Vitaly Buterin is talking about Ethereum. And I said, this guy really has it. Um, and he started talking about, you know, the, the idea of having smart contracts and the ability of the world computer and being able to decentralize autonomous organizations. So he, he was, inter and then he had the ERC-20, which was a sort of the first ex exchangeable token that opened up the ICO market. But he also came out with a 721 which was the the non fungible token? And uh, Peter, if you remember that that we got when we started to get setting up and, and seeing that this world was taking place, we were interested in setting up a company, which we did called Switch, which is now called Clean Trace, um, to accelerate the transition from from a, a fossil fuel economy to a sustainable. So we set up something in I set up by a group uh, a foundation in Zug, Switzerland. The same, actually, the same thing that Ethereum had done. So we actually had the same general counsel, and but the goal there was to verify the production of renewable energy credits. So these were self-attested uh, no uh, certificates that no one believed them, and this is where the NFT came in. And so we started working on a 721, uh, and, and this is uh, sort of uh, being able to create a, a token that was for the verification of a production of sustainable energy in a particular location at a particular time, which then- So John, be wait, before you go, before you go too much further, this notion of, uh, 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 you called it the 721, the non-fungible token. Tell me how a layman, a lay woman, a lay, lay person should think about this. Like, so what, yeah, why- I, I, I wanna, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I just don't understand what a non-fungible token well, is. I, I, what, like. what was so important about this is that, unlike other tokens that that you can you can trade and exchange, and there can have many forms of this was unique. It it, it was certification it, it, in the digital world where anything can be copies. It basically said there's one thing. There's only okay. And, so and, the and idea so was that if you generated, if you and I know it switched. The notion was if you took a photon from the sun and converted it to an electron and put it in. That was proof of work in some ways of that no, you no, actually no, no. helped generate. The unique, let me just jump in. The unique yeah, concept here. No, I, yeah, I know I realized it was not really so the proof unique, of work. But, but the point unique. is that it was unique and that it, that you, you couldn't fake it or like what well, was the non- Mick, if I might just jump in here for a second. The key yeah. concept here was if you wanted to prove that a particular solar thing at a particular location at a particular time <coughs> was doing something you wanted to attest to that unique fact that unique thing okay. that happened there and that's the same mechanism that if i created a unique work of art that token is unique uh, it's not fungible okay. it's not interchangeable so john there was this notion of a completely unique attestable thing yeah let, 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 let me add to that because yeah. yes because you had a solar panel in a particular point and place and time on a building it generated a green electron now you had on the other side you had companies having what they call power purchase agreements that they had to purchase yeah. certain number of electrons at a certain point in time now if it was self-attested no one believed it so you had to have a process uh, okay. that certified it that said now we know this is true on the basis of that then we can exchange and trade this uh, now what I see. okay we started okay. when we started doing this we put it on the ethereum test net and suddenly we found out we couldn't get on because there was this thing called crypto kitties that came on and he was what mm -hmm. the hell is crypto kitties and 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 why are people pretty and it just brought down the whole internet we on, on the test net we were the second biggest application on it and i think mm -hmm. now if you if you see what's happened with crypto kitties dapper labs created crypto kitties they just raised three and a half five million dollars they've also created their own blockchain 
which is very, I, and this is something that, that is, mm. I think it's much more sophisticated than what you see and, and, and scalable than you see in Ethereum. Mm. Or uh, and and the whole and we'll get into this later, but the whole issue of yeah. gee, burning That's, up the planet in order to do the it they yeah. didn't have so Chris get, actually you probably have yeah, something to this, say in this in terms of why why now why is this a big deal now and kind of well, how I think, smart contracts uh, and things yeah I want to I want to rapid fire I want to rapid fire because I know we got so many guests on I mean here's the thing is that yeah. the evolution of this space and crypto kitties is the perfect thing is. We had smart contracts that are neither smart nor contracts, but they were valuable because they gave us containers, i.e. tokens, that could be fungible, ERC-20, which is what ICOs ran on because they were you know, common stocks and things like that or securities or what have you, or utility tokens. And then 721s, which were non-fungibles, unique things of value inside of a container that could be programmable. And, and Ethereum certainly led the way there. And then there's been other things that came out of that founding group of Ethereum, whether it be Gavin mm. over at Polka, uh, dot or whether it be Charles over at Cardano. And so when you think about what Dapper has done, where Ethereum is current state, we're at a point where the scalability, the gas fees, a lot of the issues for those who have been watching the space or maybe investing in it for a while are still there. Now, Ethereum may have 2.0 Uniswaps doing some other things. And for the lay people, I know I'm like talking a bunch of gibberish, but the reality is, is that um, the, the, the bottom line is this, is that What's great about what's happening right now is that it's a wave, right? And so who's on that wave is this massive ecosystem inside of the Ethereum network because Ethereum mm. was basically the first to market with the ability to do these kind of things. And, and so they led the way and there's been massive investment. And so all these drops that you're seeing, whether it be Beeple or whatever, are happening inside the Ethereum ecosystem. But meanwhile, what's happening is you're getting from a $32 million industry last year to a half a billion dollar industry first four months or whatever it is of this year, right? That's that's mm. significant. But when you realize that we're in a trillion dollar remonetization, it's it's like mm. not even the first inning, right? Like you're on a yeah. wave and the people riding that wave are on Ethereum stuff and Ethereum's probably gonna launch 2.0 at some point in this year well, and there'll be some solves. But what's happening is Cardano launched literally the first decentralized blockchain ever, yes, two days ago, where every block is rendered by stakeholders and it's fully decentralized. A month earlier, mm. they were the first multi-asset ledger where now multiple tokens can be minted for a fraction of the cost, mm. no gas fees, treated like first class citizens as the same as the native currency. So what's happening is now the infrastructure is catching up. And at the same mm. time the infrastructure is catching up, the culture is saying, I want this. And, yeah, and so- Yeah, because now know, it's kind of part of pop culture all well, of a and sudden. There's a very, and there's I think there's an interesting- yeah. There's an interesting point where Art, Art comes in here, and this is where uh, we'll talk to Martin in a little bit, which is, as we had the rise of interest in collecting NFTs, and John, you and I were at an NFT conference three years ago, right? It was clear this was a mechanism for collectibles or art, if but anybody wanted them. But at the time, I mean, crypto culture was, you know, it was kind of like early blockchain, Ethereum stuff. There wasn't a collecting thing. As we went into this year, and we saw lots of people at home. And then, you know, we saw the Robin Hood trading stuff go on and the GameStop stuff. And in general, any auction house was reporting people were buying stuff. They were buying autographs, they're buying art, people were buying right. stuff for their homes. And then you also had all of us living in our virtual lives. So we got much cozier with virtual. It was against that background that NFTs that had been around kind of rode a late autumn wave of blockchain and Bitcoin coming back. And then just walk us through a little bit of what happened in the last few months that then has led to. Um, well, I, I was talking to someone about this, and I, and I, I think, and, and, and uh, we're trying to look at this in luxury goods and another application right. as it becomes more consumer oriented. And it, this person was saying, well, it reminded him at the, point, the inflection point when you started to getting people buying things online and, and, and on the web. You know, it was like, okay, it's become an everyday thing. It's not mm. just a geeky thing. And I do think, I, I think you having different generations of technology um, that were rapidly going through. And now there can, it can become more consumer facing yeah. and scalable. I mean, yeah. I do, I would really recommend people to look at flow uh, 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 that's come mm. out of Dapper Labs. I think they're, they're in a whole nother level. Uh, they've sort of, they're really- What does flow do? Well, Flow, Flow is, that, is a blockchain. I mean, yeah. It's where they've run a lot of the auctions now because you don't have the cost yeah. and you it's not 
when they when they say there's 200 million dollars just done in NFTs, that's part of the yeah, Ethereum that they've all they've done probably that much on on flow as well. And and so and they just flow is it. made by who or again it's, I feel like I don't have any idea Dapper, what you're talking about. Dapper Labs is is the people who started uh, uh, CryptoKitties. And then they raised 300, and they just finished a, 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 I guess an A series, $305 million. They have all this uh, top tier venture groups behind them. And they, they're creating a whole toolkit for, for that is very consumer facing. It's, it's, you just, you feel that's a next generation. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not I do remember game. way back in the day being, you know, at, at um, South by in an early, I mean, 20, for 13, 14, where there was a, a Bitcoin uh, ATM machine. And it was yeah. kind of silly too, though, because you know, you probably watch like somebody stand there for 35 minutes to get a to get a ten dollar bill out or something like that. Yeah, but but anyway. uh, yeah, I do think yeah. this this feels like the moment to bring in uh, some exa you know, some some examples of what we're suddenly starting to see. We'll maybe having Sarah and Jesse come in and then we'll bring you all in back when we do sure. a kind of dinner well, table round up and everything. Uh, uh as we do this transition, Chris, I just wanted to show a slide of yours, uh, which you had you had this really interesting generational slide that I think can give us a view, both yeah. in terms of who who's been part of the Bitcoin world, right? So part of what we're seeing mm -hmm. here is a it's grown and b it's an eighteen to thirty four or forty four phenomenon. Yeah, and I and I want to tee up Jesse and Sarah because I I think this is a good mm -hmm. transition. And on that slide, here's here's the point, right? It's not about Bitcoin. Here's the point is that. Um, without debating the religion of Bitcoin, it's obviously become a store of value when Tesla's buying a billion and a half of it, when sailors going all in, right? And so at that point you go, okay, whatever we're hyped up about NFTs, which the current state of people's understanding of NFTs are collectibles of art. The reality is, is everything from the paint to the components of the whatever could also be decentralized, identified and part of the NFT provenance. And there's a bunch of stuff to really unpack. It's exciting, including the publishing in the future of music publishing and how you can use AI and singularity and things mm -hmm. to, to pay royalties through smart contracts and democratize mo and monetize fandom. So there's a whole bunch of stuff I know Jesse's going to mm -hmm. talk about. That's what we're steeped mm -hmm. in. That's what we're building infrastructure and layer twos for. But the context here is if someone's talking about NFTs, my first question is, do you own a Bitcoin? Because it contextualizes us to where we are and how early and how hyped up this is. Because if you don't own mm. a Bitcoin, but you're buying an NFT, you don't know what the hell you're doing. And, mm. and, and you have zero idea of where value is. You're just chasing mm. the market. And the reality okay. is, is if we really get thoughtful, the opportunity on the op side of this, the opportunity to remonetize and democratize creation, culture, art, and put that business onto a whole new vector is what's underlying all this. And if we stop just taking mm. the money that's available on the table, but we start thinking about it through a three to five year, 10 year lens, we are facing the biggest Renaissance opportunity in my life and in yours. But and, you know, Chris, I, I wanted to say, I, I mean, I'm, I am excited by that too, but, and, and you and I know each other well, and, 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 uh, and certainly at some point in my life, I ended up with some tokens as an advisor to a company. Um, they're not block, they're not Bitcoin. But they're talking, and I have like a weird crypto USB thing that holds on to them and all that. And I'm positive that they worth nothing today. And I certainly never bought a Bitcoin. And, and you know, to me, it just looked like kind of a, a little bit of a speculative scam. So I was just like, good luck with that. Um, but, but I also look at it and go, okay, now PayPal apparently lets me convert to, to Bitcoin. And then I go, it says Ethereum, but then is it Ethereum 2, which is actually not going to burn down a you know, an entire rainforest every time I mint one, or is it Ethereum one? You can't actually tell. So there's no way that I have bought a Bitcoin. Am I just an idiot? I know that in that no, chart, I, I, I think even buy anything or be a, a part of this. But nobody's an idiot. I might make a suggestion no, here. I think it's a really interesting so time. So a normal human, you know, really, can that's, do that's something. That's my point. Transition, Chris, into the more, Jesse, I'd love to hear from you a little bit. Uh, we're at this point of transition in this conversation where the NFT starts emerging as a mechanism for unique creative things. Well, we're going to get individual stuff in a moment, but you're working with musicians. Sarah, you create SoundWorks. Uh, so just talk to us about how NFT started fitting into the horizon of your musicians during this year when they had to be virtual, they had to find new business models. Kind of walk us through the last few months. 
And we okay, need to have you turn your audio on. That's one of the key parts of the entire sound world. <laughs> it was a very rough start to this pandemic for the music's music world and the creators. 90% of their revenue was wiped off the books when touring had to stop to a halt and artists had to get innovative and look at new opportunities. They are very well positioned right now for where things are going. Uh, music business is in a really good spot. There is so much money flowing back into music right now. And this is before the touring boom that's about to happen. It's really a gold rush. Uh, like I haven't so this seen. This is it. very different than than what we heard a few months ago, right? You were on here a few months ago, and it was just like, oh my gosh, people are trying to figure out how do I tour virtually? How do I, you know, you had you had Beyonce, and you you had other things where people were doing like you know streaming on Instagram. Well, you had and done all the night long DJing and things, and it but it seemed like people were trying hard. Erica Badu was doing amazing work out there in her house, but you know trying to also support her whole crew or staff and musicians and now it's come around the bend a bit so so is that where you what you're what you're reporting now in terms of artists have gotten very savvy when it comes to the live space it's been brand mm. partnerships pandemonium everybody mm. in the pandemic play on the word everybody is doing mm. brand partnerships it's a great time this was an arbitrage opportunity that more and more brands mm. and artists are willing to play ball in there's been multiple mm of income that have come in that have plussed up the artists plus the stimulus packages that are coming into the venues and some promoters every venue mm. in new york city has been made whole for 2020 without even doing a show so if they were savvy and they oh, did really? streaming shows yeah. they were already in a good space that's without yeah. the roll-ups and all the other uh SPACs and investment opportunities. It just seems like everybody's running around with a blank check trying to support a big idea. It's a really mm. exciting time. And not to mention the streaming space, there's more and more opportunities. So Jesse, into this ferment mm. of things turning around, I would love you to tell us. And then because I mean there was streaming, there used to be you could sell it on iTunes. There's something about an NFT that appealed to your artists and also Sarah as an artist that must be appealing to you. Kind of get us onto the table, its properties, why there's particular interest, and why, I mean, like the art world, no one had a good solution to collecting digital art at scale, but there was plenty of solutions to music at scale. So what happened? It's revenue, it's marketing, it's community. It's a, a whole bunch of those things combined. It's the perfect storm for now where artists can connect to consumers direct. It's where the industry is going, but all of a sudden there's this moment where because of this crypto boom, there's supporters, there's Medici's, there are investors, like not any every NFT is working, but the ones that have the support of the community are getting astronomical prices and basically paving the way for the future. I don't think that- So, these NFTs so Jesse, give, it, give me an, an example NFTs of, you know, I know I've heard about Beeple, you know, on the, on the, on the pixel side, but what, what, if, what's happening on the music side? Like what's a tangible example of what you're talking about? Like an NFT in the music side that's taken off. Blau released an album. Uh, Blau's a DJ in the electronic world. His father is in the finance space. He's savvy. He comes from this world. He went to Wash U. He was a smart kid. I knew him in college. He built his, a little career for himself as an electronic DJ, but he galvanized this Bitcoin and crypto community. Uh, okay. He's very relevant on Clubhouse and has created uh, a Discord chat room. And it's like a who's who of DJs hmm. coaching them all in this. He put out his album a month ago, made $13 million direct to fans, and then put a follow up oh, at wow. $10 million. That's $20 million in the bank in one month. Wow. And oh. and it goes to what John said about kind of get rid of the middleman, the central banker in some ways. This is kind of going straight between the consumers and, and, and the, Jesse, and, how you many know, the fans was and, it, the, and was the artists. It, was it an auction or buy as many as you want? What was the economics? Auctions. Auctions are the only way that you're galvanizing these huge prices. It's rare, rare, rare. And that's what's what's commanding these huge prices because we don't know what's going to be the collectibles. Did he, he auction like the base auction? So basically his, his 
then his work became like a public work. Like anybody could listen to it, but one guy got to own it. Exactly. One guy got to own the certain Supreme package and the Supreme, but he gave different layers to it. So you tear it and there's certain packages. So, and he's offering physical experiences too, like for the Supreme mm. and buyers of this package, they were able to connect with him uh, forever, right? In perpetuity, <laughs> you have his email and you have his availability. Uh -oh. going Forever's a long time. It's going to be an interesting- Sarah, as, a, as an life. artist in this space creating That's spatial wild. audio, tell us a little about what that is and is it as exciting for you as it is for everybody that uh, Jesse knows? Oh my God, absolutely. I do want to start by saying I don't own a Bitcoin. I own pieces of a Bitcoin, but I do own a Blau NFT. So he is doing amazing in the space. Um, I am a spatial audio musician, but the past 10 years of my career has been spent building the distribution method for that. And we're finally at this point and it's through NFTs. So I'm building an NFT marketplace with spatial audio capabilities uh, called Unseen, where not only my music will be released, but also the music of other artists. The reason being is we're moving into Web3 with NFTs, and a big part of that is spatial audio is necessary as the music streaming component of that. Uh, so it's exciting for me because we've never had a time before. I, I tried through virtual reality, I tried through augmented reality uh, to really bring spatial audio works to market, and we're able to do that in a much seamless, easier way uh, through the blockchain and NFTs. Um, let's talk hey, a Sarah, about does this, uh, well, wait one sec before go we go to part of this. So Sarah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm wearing the AirPod Maxes. Um, nice. you know, they have the amazing ability that kind of freak you out when you're like watching a movie to actually hear it coming from the other side or things like that. Is it partly the pandemic and the rise of like high fidelity and things like that, where you're actually having, you know, spatialized and also kind of distance, you know, you can, you can hear when you're walking close to somebody and get a, you know, a conversation going at these virtual conferences and the rise of, of, of technology that actually allow us to, to love it and experience it. Because it's, it's funny, when I had a Sony Walkman and I listened to it, the music was always the same and I thought it was great, but actually for like my, my parents' generation, you know, if they moved their head, it actually was binaural. It was, you know, because the actual person on the fiddle was was left or right, right? So they always had it, and then we we gave it away with Sony Walkman, and then and then now we're suddenly getting it back again. What what um, what's you you mentioned unseen? How could people watching this experience something? Like what would be a way that we would be able to try out and learn about maybe binaural audio and spatialized audio and things like that? And then what should we be looking for from what you're up to? Absolutely. Uh, so you can check out on YouTube. There are binaural pieces available. There's one that's about 10 years old and it's called the virtual barbershop. I usually send people mm. there to listen because it's accessible and you can close your eyes and really hear the sounds all around you uh, just on like a mm. horizontal plane. But in higher orders of spatial audio, we can actually experience music above us and below us. It's extremely immersive. Yeah. And with now the Apple AirPod Pros and the Apple Maxes, you have this head related transfer function feature where when you're moving your head, it's moving with you realistically like it does in real life. And with video games, for whatever reason, yeah. we just expected them to continually get better and better with the visuals. I mean, I can hardly tell like what's real and what's not anymore when I see a video game, but we've given up when it comes to stereo and recorded music. Um, yeah. And this is just mm. making it more realistic for us. And by the way, it's uh, to tell a personal story here. My AirPods Maxes arrived yesterday, and I was convinced to get them because Robert Scoble kept telling me they're the best things in the world. And I got that if you were looking at movies or games and moving around, that was powerful. And so I said to Robert, "Well, how does this work in music?" And we, I realized you'd have to remaster music to get its spatial dimensions right. In other words, because, for example, there's this wonderful show on Netflix. Uh, called calls, which is this very spatial. You're, you're, it's a voyeuristic thing in phone calls, but it's mastered spatially, um, not unlike the way that we mastered things in quadraphonic in like 1972. For I was going to say, this sounds like quadraphonic. You know, my my yeah. uh, my brother-in-law had like a joystick, and he could just move it around the living room, 
And it was playing off yeah. of like eight track tapes that were quadraphonic. Yeah. I just remember that was the future. Okay, so we're, we're so Sarah and and Jesse, is there? Are we on the precipice of a music being remastered and taking advantage of all this? Is that part of what's going to driving this? I believe so, personally. I think right now NFTs are being made with stereo music, yeah. uh, but it's actually not future proofing them because yeah. you want your NFTs to continually sell in the secondary market so that your artists get that money in perpetuity. Yeah. If your mm. music is not made in spatial audio, you're actually putting your artists at a disservice. That's my belief. Let's talk a little about Whoa. the qualities of NFTs that make them particularly exciting. Jesse, you mentioned the community quality, and it's clear that one of the cool things that's going on is that many of these NFT artists, like people, had a lot of fans. So far, all you could do is like like them on Instagram, which was a mark, but suddenly along comes this mechanism where you can support them, and also that network effect starts bringing people in, right? So there's there's a community aspect to it. Sarah, you talked about the super distribution aspect, which is as it gets sold and sold again, the artist can participate. What are some of the other uh, features or qualities of this that are disruptive for artists? And John, if you want to come back or anybody else, let us, you know, give us thoughts on this. But I'd, I'd be interested in teasing those out, guys. The physical experiences that match with these auctions and these NFTs are unbelievable because now there's no middleman. There's all of a sudden you've been in an industry that's never had direct communication with the fans. Never has there been V to C. You're dealing through a record label, through a distribution service or a DSP to your audience, or you're dealing through Tower Records to your audience. There's never been that direct communication between artist and fan. And now in this world, they're meeting. They're meeting for the first time in a exchange and all of a sudden, it opens up all of these doors of what can happen in the physical space, in the merch space, in the communication space, in the fan club space. This is the end of the music business as it was. The power is no longer in the hands of the record labels and artists. And this movement is starting to happen from the top up anyway. But through this movement, this will be the point where artists will now own their masters and be able to Jesse, someone's going to be a big loser. Who's the big loser coming up in all this? The, the labels. The labels are crushing it. They've invested. They've made so much profit. The streaming world, they're so heavily in bed with the Spotify's and the Apple Music's and the, these platforms. They've done so well. The industry is just going to grow. When you talk about remastering all of these records, that's a whole new format. We're going from- So you're saying this isn't going to hurt the labels at all. They're, they've already- they're, I'll be yeah. contrarian there. I'll be contrarian there just for the sake of a good yeah. argument. Um, I don't think the labels get hurt long run, but just like IBM didn't go out of business. Um, so the labels are still going to play a major role. I think what you're seeing, and this is my contrarian view, is the labels realize their business model's broken and the the next generation, right? So why is KKR doing a deal for half a billion or half a trillion dollar fund with BMG? Because they know if they don't buy up every right now, five years from now, the artists are going to be too empowered and they won't be able to get it. So I think what you're seeing is this, this pent up, I was broke to Jesse's earlier point of my entire revenue that was left after iTunes and Napster and everybody else in the platforms demonetized, dematerialized and democratized everything. After I was left with nothing but a CPM model as a business and live was my only thing. And then COVID kicked my ass. As soon as I have a way to get 20 million in a month, I'm in. And so you're seeing this rush into a broken first generation, very unscalable platform ecosystem of nfts mm. flow being a, a unique uh i think future play so i agree with you there john that they're doing some interesting things but the bottom line is you're seeing this first wave and it's massive and it's awesome and we should endorse it we should also contextualize it in the sense of everybody's ignorant to what else is out there because no one's spent any time on this and the money's so big right now everybody's rushing in trying to catch the bubble so snoop drops today yeah. everybody's trying to catch their 150 200 million before someone gets scammed and the space yeah. goes into winter which it will but, but is this john uh, you had a comment here this, john yeah, let's go over to john, yeah, sorry, here. john. Yeah, I, I mean i i think that what we're looking at in in the sort of 
the current use of, of uh, NFTs is sort of being verifying a unique property. It's just the beginning. I think you're going to go to the dynamic NFTs. You're going to have a whole set of services, the ability to build a relationship with with the the, the, the with your fan base and actually build economy out of that, and within that, build a community that has its own sense of value and exchange that people can participate in. That's where I think that the next step is going to be. And 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 I do think it, yes, there have been scalable problems, all that with Ether. But I, if you look at Flow, you look at Tezos, you look at like there, there, you could Cardano, you look at you look at uh, yeah, there's Polkadot. So, I mean, there's so, other things. And I think, I mean, the other thing that I, I'm interested in identity, I think what's happening, they're going to do an NFT 735 for self-sovereign identity. So you have your profile that's going to protect it. That changes the business model and information well, and media completely. So that there's suddenly you're flipping, you're, you're flipping the economics and that the value is going, it's going to be more communitarian than libertarian in my view. Uh, and that's, hmm. so that's a break with it was sort of the, the, the Bitcoin narrative. Um, and I think art is going to lead the way because it is a, a communitarian thing. And, and I would uh, like to, uh, John, at this point, bring in one of our guests who has a lot of firsthand experience with what it's like for a market to get disrupted in the middle of this. Steve Sachs, let's bring mm -hmm. Steve Sachs up. Steve, okay. you are Bitforms, and we've been friends. We met at the Guggenheim probably 15, 20 years ago, and I've been collecting uh software-based artworks we've had many people we had golden levin and his crew on the show just a couple weeks ago yeah and and here you had to build up an industry around how do people collect something as as ethereal as, as software right so um you know are they collecting you know i get a certificate of identity i have a computer that, that's unique and into this ferment comes nft so walk walk me through a little bit about what your last few months have been and what this has meant to the world of galleries to the world of collection traditional auctions yeah well, um, I haven't slept much, put it that way. Um, it's, it's been incredibly disruptive, but also incredibly exciting because where there was a very small audience that we were reaching over the past 20 years in terms of selling digitally native work, now maybe 100 million plus understand that a digital file can be considered a work of art. And that is just a massive change, um, but it's also complicated <laughs> because right now the platforms that exist today, um, when they first started, there were a few that were interesting, they were being curated, but as the money started pouring in yeah. and as the crypto world started kind of supporting art as, I guess, as a, a credibility builder in a way for the currency, um, it just blew up. And now, you know, most of these sites are overwhelming. And my artists are getting, who are experimenting with these platforms, are feeling lost. And they don't feel, unless they are celebrity or have a huge following on social media, they're right. just getting buried. And which is in a way for me as a gallerist, a good thing because the point of a gallery is to curate and to build an artist's career. And if they're now coming back to me and saying, when, a, when is Bitform's gallery building a site where we can actually get back to a, a deeper understanding of our work, a deeper understanding of curation? And so we're in the process of doing that right now. Perfect. As this phenomenon came out, there were a number of interesting things. For example, just creatively, Many of the works that sold as NFTs were, you know, relatively low resolution JPEGs, and you were selling deeply high resolution 8K things or long forms of video. So there was a there was a disparity here between the thing people were collecting and what fine art was. There's a disparity between the collector mentality, right? Your collectors, older people, they put stuff on their walls. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of evidence that younger people who collect NFTs. They don't really care about sticking on the wall, but it's cool to share it or have it on an iPhone. Um, yeah. The curation thing is very interesting because on the one hand, anybody can come to that market, but you and I were on open sea the other night and it went on and on and on. And what were we using? We needed a curation mechanism. Ours was who was popular. It was a very populist curation mechanism, Absolutely. right? It was like who had the most friends and followers or had you know done whatever they did to manipulate the internet to get the most of that. Very different than 
than, than a gallerist or a curator or a museum or that discipline. Uh, Jesse, do these things go on in, in your world? Like, does the music world feeling like uh, things are completely democratized, but we're getting lost again? Or how, how do these concerns translate in your world? We're seeing the shift happening. So it's this independent artist movement. And now the more freedom you have, the more flexibility you have, the more ability you have to take advantage of these new opportunities. I think a lot of these artists have been kind of in a fog throughout this year and now are starting to come out and say, wow, what is this space? And how do I maximize the opportunities? So definitely uh, it's, you know, I would say if we just did a survey for a client where we did a, a, a consensus and a focus group on what's happening in the space, looking at all the social platforms and their take on this, most of them, I would say 90% of artists still do not understand what NFTs are or even understand or even do anything in the space. This is still super duper early, but that's where a lot of the opportunity lies and a lot well, of the figures being fit. A big concern, you guys mentioned it a little bit, um, has been the environmental concerns. And a lot of my artists are holding back because of the, um, uh, the, the ETH, you know, the energy concerns about ETH. So we, we have to really consider that. I mean, I'm also concerned about it. I don't know what's true, what's not true, but we're hearing a lot of bad things. Um, so for example, we're trying to do something that is working with Tezos, which is proof of stake, right. for example. Right. Um, now, if we do that, yes, we will um, appeal to, to the environmental issues, but we certainly will lose a huge market not by not using Ethereum. But we're, we're potentially willing to take that risk. So this this thing that go ahead, John. Wait, wait, wait. I, I, yeah, John has something. You look at flow. You should look at flow because a lot yep. of it would be done in flow. And flow scales is a separate block. They, they, there, there is the protocol is, is is scale. It doesn't have the issues. I think those things. And Martin can. Well, and this is a great tee up for Martin. I'd like to bring Martin in because um, this issue that ETH burns through a lot of carbon. I mean, it bothered people who were doing Ethereum and blockchain a couple of years ago. But the artist community that is actually more socially conscious than perhaps the rest of crypto people really had an issue with it. And out of that came um, came your project. You and I met when we were actually working together on Switch and we were working on uh, projects in Puerto Rico. And you've done a lot of work at Yale on the environmental world. How is it that you became part of the carbon drop <laughs> and kind of a mechanism to deal with the carbon implications of uh, of, of NFTs? Um, thanks. This is, this is totally fascinating. And, and what the first thing I feel like saying is it's really amazing how this has empowered artists to broadcast their voice. We've had cryptocurrencies for several years now. Bitcoin's energy consumption has gone up. Uh, Ethereum's energy consumption has gone up. Um, and you know, a lot of us have been like raising the red flag about this. Um, and there's, it's very hard to control, but as soon as it touches the art space, like you said, the sensitivity, the environmental sensitivity makes that this becomes a, an active thing that we can talk about. Um, our, you know, what we did is the, the, the foundation has been working on setting up open digital infrastructure to improve how humans manage our relationship with planet Earth. And a, and a lot of that is how do we coordinate that? In, in the climate space, everyone's building the websites, but no one's building the Internet. It's, 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 it has to be public, digital public space. Um, and, and coordination. And I think that the, the other thing that's fascinating is that it allows artists to support initiatives that, that they believe in. And, and, and that relates to the work of the foundation, but, but really being able to support something on climate. Now, let's talk about also produce. Yep. Well, tell us about that because this was a mechanism where artists donated to your nonprofit, the work, their auction happened. This is now funding your work. And in a way, we have living artists who are pretty new, who suddenly have financial clout, who have the ability to work with you to direct that to causes. This is a new thing. So walk us through kind of what happened here in the carbon drop. 
Yeah. Um, so there, there's a couple of things, right? The, the artists aligned to support uh, a project on climate. Uh, we also, using NFTs that attest to the unique carbon offset, uh, John was alluding to this um, before, those were pecked to the artwork. So we calculated how much the impact it, it has um, and uh, created a bit of, of, of offsetting, which means reductions happen here, emissions happen here, and we try to uh, peg them together. Now, offsets have a very important role to play in actions around climate change, but they're not ultimate solutions. We have to reduce our emissions uh, internally. And, and that was a lot of what, what the language on the, on the site was. So it allowed, it allowed artists to be able to broadcast the importance of information, create awareness about the energy and carbon impact of, of blockchains, in this case, Ethereum that uses proof of work. Um, and it allowed all, us to also work with the platform with Nifty Gateway to work on their climate strategy as well. Uh, there's a couple of things that happen in the process. We did not do open editions. We did not, every single artist just had one single piece because at the moment, the way that the smart contract works in Nifty Gateway, you have to create one single Ethereum transaction for every piece in your edition. So that the amount of energy consumption would have gone a lot higher. And so that also made it a, a, a way of of showcasing those nuances and those sensitivities and allows people to start thinking about the carbon implications of that. At the higher end, what, what is fascinating is that not only are, are artists are now pushing the agenda of environmental concerns around blockchain, they, they're able to support things that they truly care. And, I, and for the philanthropic world, for the nonprofit world, that is totally game changing. So uh, our work is quite complex in terms of <clears throat> using blockchain, smart contracts, IoT, AI. And so when we speak to the traditional philanthropic world that, that, that cares about climate and supports climate, they have a hard time understanding that. It's super, but it's pretty innovative or, or disruptive to, to what they're used to supporting. But for artists, they, they get it, or at least it, it, it allows them to support yeah. real ideas for radical. And, and I think Martin, that's also going to affect the, the philanthropic space. And, and I'm, I'm super excited by this and also concerned and confused by it, you know, because um, I remember a week or two ago, a few weeks ago, there was that calculator that let you look to see when you made an NFT, how many uh, thousands of years of a European flying, flying on a plane it was the equivalent to, or how many acres or hundreds or thousands of hectares it was of burning down the rainforest. You know, and then I have this other, you know, angel on my shoulder, Greta, Greta, you know, talking in my other ear saying, uh, actually, it's not about something in 2040 that we should be worried about. It's every action you take today that's either going to make or break the extinction event for humans. The plan will probably be fine. We'll lose, you know, 90% of, of wildlife, but, you know, we can always grow that back over a few billion years. Well, these things seem at odds, you know, and then I'm, I'm hearing the kind of rise of as John said, libertarianism, you know, and, and of course that all makes me think of Atlas Shrugged or something like that. And then the rise of communitarianism, um, which I probably don't know enough about. And then I think about like pro-social efforts, you know, David Sloan Wilson and others, Eleanor Ostrom, who've looked at kind of how do, how do people co cooperate in positive ways that actually lead to something better than themselves. <laughs> And I, and I keep looking at this and then we get a comment on the live stream of how do you how do you feel about the ridiculous NFT that Logan Paul selling the moment he pulled a card from a Pokemon deck? You know, and then I start thinking, okay, wait, will, will the, should we have new science fiction books that are about how we didn't die from nuclear holocaust that we didn't die from climate, we died from like uh, a JPEG? Or something, or like a trivial moment in our lives. All right, Martin. I, I, Mickey's got some I tough mean, questions just for you. Naive there. about this. I don't see that. Yeah, who's who's got an yeah, answer? I, mean, I think I, I'll I'll weigh in a little bit on that because I think what you're touching on is is the risk and the reward of speculative activity, right? Speculation causes conversations like this, which for someone who's been nothing but in this space, um, especially around non fungibles and tokens for the last several years. I'm sitting here going, oh my God, like, yes, 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 yes. And then I'm thinking about 15 other people I need to meet. So whether it's the first time you're exposed to any of this spaghetti on the wall or the 80,000th time, speculation is what's making this possible. So when you think about the mind share and the hive of humanity's best, best brains 
that are in this conversation now, tertiary or primary, because people are getting rich. That's the positive side of speculation, right? The negative mm. side of it is people are getting rich <clears throat> and humanity throws it all out the door and just goes, give me the money and I'll worry about the consequences later. Yeah. And so you yeah. get the, the, the downside, but you can't have one without the other. So I think the better question to ask is what other questions we should be in? What is the role curation plays in the future? How do labels mm. innovate their business model? How do artists and communities mm. connect? What is the future of remastering sound or art or combining these things in ways that have never been possible before? Who do I need to invite to the conversation that I've ignored because they're not a capitalist or because they're not you know, green minded? Yeah. Right? These are the questions that are more insightful and that this causes. So I think if we just realize why we're excited, we shouldn't be excited because we're fearing of missing out, getting rich on this first wave of bubble. We should be excited because there's this much to solve. Yeah. Right. Yeah. At a time, no, I, I, at a time. I love that. I think, I think that's helpful for me. Um, John, you looked like you had something to weigh in on. And, and by the oh, way, I, Sarah I, and Jesse and others, be sure to open your mouths because we're, we're like a rough crew here tonight. So we've got <laughs> well, lots I, of, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. <laughs> well, I, I do, there's, there's this narrative about, you know, that everyone's focusing on proof of work in the Bitcoin and that therefore you're, you're decimating uh, you know, the planet. But there, there, there are really rapidly evolving alternatives to that. And so I think the cost of this is going to be the cost of, of doing a, a credit card transaction. I mean, it's, it, and, 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 it's, it's, and that's getting folded into it. And I, I do think mm -hmm. we're at a collection point where it's not just looking at, it's sort of speculating on rare items, is that, I mean, which is what, but you're actually getting a more complex notion of a dynamic NFT that allows you to build relationships mm -hmm. and communities and generate value and have other people generate value around. That's going to be well, that, that's what I get excited about. about. I would you know, love this, to even hear. what Jesse was saying, you know, this notion of of they had different tiers that allowed you to have a different relationship or open up a relationship yeah, that's with your fans. fans. I mean, that, that's that's you have a direct relationship, and and that's just a natural human impulse. And that's and I think that's where you get a foothold. And that's where this foothold is. It, it, it's not just techies saying it; it's people naturally want to do it. So I don't think they have to know about Bitcoin or anything. I, I think that the next generation is going to say, "Hey, this is this really cool." I got, the, and they're going to more consumer. Yeah, they're going to yeah. instinctively go to the next thing, and that's why I think having worked in identity forever is like this. Seven thirty-five. You hate to admit it. I think it's probably going to be a key element because people can get their identity and their profile, and they own their own information. Bingo, that, that's transformative. Well, I do, you know, I'm very excited by self-sovereignty and self-sovereignty at a fractal level, right? The notion that we could have self-sovereign, you know, sovereignty across the world. Right, um, right. It also disintermediates the Facebooks of the world or the others who have largely been kind of using the fact that you have to give up all your data to them I, in I exchange think, for something, so. But this is the argument, I, you know, I was involved with this for 15 years at Berkman Center and every. And, and we, yeah. we're trying to push this rock over the hill and tell people it's good for them, take your medicine, do it this way. And and yeah. I think it's now just gonna be, oh, that's a cool thing to do. You know, I got a 735. Yeah, make it pop culture. Yeah. And, and suddenly you just flip the whole, the, the business one. That's, well, yes. what, what, can I just ask a question on this transition? Everyone here has kind of brought up the fact that they're uneasy with Ethereum proof of work because of the carbon purposes. Martin, you pointed out, or I think someone in the call pointed out that um, uh, you could go to other platforms, but you might sacrifice market and awareness. Yes. I was having the same conversation with Barry at Gray Area earlier, right? A lot of our mark artists want to go do things, but do we pull the trigger on a lot of Ethereum stuff or do we go elsewhere? And it feels like we're like in a transition here that in a way is being artist driven. So I'd love to hear from Sarah, from your community, from Jesse. Are we in a transition and from a marketing point of view, how do we make that transition, you know, Chris, where we're not sacrificing the value here, but we get onto a platform that clearly moves us further? Well, you, I, I'm going to say real quick and then let somebody else talk. There's there's interoperability, right? So if if you need to hit the market now and Ethereum is your best path, you hit it and then you can migrate mm -hmm. to a, a Cardano platform or a Flow. There is the, the right way to think about this is, again, decentralized IDs, both at the product level, at the user level, at the fan level, at the artist level. They create self-sovereign actors in a marketplace. That's what we're building. Like that's that's literally we're taking the market that that very thing in July. And so 
I agree 100% with John on that. But what, what you're really doing is you're saying, go to market where you can, and then have a plan for how you can port that to a platform that might suit your needs better or in another way down the road. And so it's Sarah not a binary and, decision. Sarah it's and Jesse, in your communities, how important roles is playing in the music world, sound world? I, I think that we should stay as far away from Bitcoin and the currency, connected to the currency as possible. I like the idea of the art and the collectible and the auction and the rarity. And I, that is interesting to me and to my clients. I feel like the crypto world is in a lot of way not where it is. Blockchain is the future. And I think that there's a lot of risk still associated and i know that that's maybe not the most popular and there's a lot to that but like in my personal opinion there's so much speculation and there's so much like uncertainty around bitcoin like i have the personal fear that like bitcoin could ultimately cap topple the economy that's like the next mortgage bust. but jesse let me ask a question about this relationship between uh artists causes and nonprofits. so martin pointed out that for the carbon drop, he got significant artists to donate work that created how much how much was raised in all of that, Martin? Six point six million. Good. Well, Thanks, we know <laughs> that that artists could generate a fair amount. Are artists now beginning to donate things for causes to spin up things like this? All, yeah. well, all of these drops should have a social good component. I yeah. feel like every new company now should have a social good component. Does it need yeah. to climate change? Maybe, maybe not. Other causes that might be more important right, right now. Obviously, there's a lot going on. To and, but definitely the community resonates behind a cause, well, and hopefully and this is enough reason to put it in climate change and and carbon yeah. neutral and offsetting all the damage. I just don't know what's real and what isn't there. So we know that there's Asian hate. We know that there's the George Floyd case going on. We know that there's like all sorts of bigger issues that's happening right now in the, in the world in terms yeah, of- A lot of people could use some help. Yeah. On a yeah. level. So we're, we're definitely always considering uh, a large portion or a portion of the proceeds going to a cost. And I think- Sarah, you're building a platform. So you have to think about all this stuff up front. What's, what, what are your concerns? What's going on in your world? I mean, one thing that's a concern that I've been thinking a lot about is just even talking about nonprofits, separating the payment when people purchase an NFT, being able to actually have part of the proceeds go directly to that nonprofit. Right now, that capability doesn't exist. And then when you're uh, paying out, say, like IP rights or music. It will in July. <laughs> coming up, coming up. Then uh, with IP rights and music, you know, paying out with the token is still non-compliant. So we're in a weird place when it comes to music IP rights and fractionalizing mm -hmm. that as well. So I'm of the mindset that I'm I'm taking baby steps and doing like what's possible and will just evolve over time. But I, I actually disagree. I think it's important to get music artists in the space now. Can I say something, Peter? Yeah, so of course. The, the <laughs> other big um, disruptor in my world is there's the trend is for the artist to actually mint their own work, right? Um, so that means they're actually paying me versus the gallery paying them, which is like completely flipped, right? And also because they have that power, like we're talking about, many of them want to right. kind of split the profits amongst different parties. So that was a really drastic change in, in a business model mm. that, that I've never seen before. Um, so wait, Steve, I'll unroll that a little bit more because I don't know if I ex understand it because you said pay me instead of the gallery, but I keep it, I think of you as the gallery. You're the gallery. Yeah, yeah I meant the gallery. You're paying the gallery. Form. So, so yeah, so, so say this to me again. You've got an artist who now can mint their own NFT. Well, uh, Historically, they had to pay some some fee to a gallery to represent them and to, of course, help curate and put the show together and things. So it, go into that more with more detail just so that I can understand. I feel kind of well, dumb there's I'm missing. The, the, the collector base, um, as Jesse was saying, th they want this connection to the artist, right? If I minted it as a gallery, they don't feel that connection, right? Ah, uh, uh, okay, okay. So 
so the artist mints it. So it's, it, the, the, the fees are actually going to the artist's wallet, right? Yeah. And then I have a deal with the artist and every, every situation is different. And that artist agrees to give me the gallery a certain percentage because we're still representing these artists in a much deeper way than NFTs. NFTs is one yeah. aspect of their world, right? Yeah. Most of my artists have, have a much broader um, uh, body of work. And also, you know, the majority of NFTs, which, which we all have seen, are very um, small glimpses into their creative process. These are like JPEGs and 10 second animations. You know, my artists have been doing for 20 years, very elaborate, long format, digitally native files yeah. that are m go way beyond what you're seeing in the NFT world right now. So I look at the NFT for my artists as actually a marketing vehicle to uh. bring them into their larger practice. But Steve, is it also fair to say though, because I mean, I've seen some of the, your work and, and, and the artist's work, and it's just stunning to me. I mean, it's beautiful, but I also have seen it like on a wall. Exactly. It reacts to me when I move my head back and forth in a beautiful frame. And one of the things I think our first conversation when you were probably at Peter's house, because Peter's an art collector of your work and your artist's work, um, was about the archival challenges. Absolutely. Like, uh, you know, if you build something that happens to run in Macromedia Director in 1997, and it's a beautiful piece of generative art, and people just push an update to a laptop or push an update to the background, <laughs> like Windows 95 destroys it, and Macromedia, yeah. of course, Adobe pulls off the shelf, it's gone. And can you have that art work again? And you had people like Jaron Lanier saying he spent six months trying to get a piece of his art that he booted up and, you know, as a yeah. VR pioneer, he booted up in the 70s or 80s. He can't get it to run again because he can't get the right set of memory yeah. cards and the right set of yeah, yeah. drivers well, and the right set of whatever to do it. And I've gone through that myself. So tell me a little bit about um, what will be the new role of digital archivists or the new role of people who actually do preservation? Because Art is interesting in that you you kind of want to be able to give it to your ch your children or your grandchildren, your great grandchildren. You want to be able to say, "I want to donate it to this gallery, or give it, to, or, or let somebody take it." But what does it mean when, like, I have an iBook? When I buy an iBook, an iPad, an iBook, I don't own it. I can't yeah. I can't give this to my son and say this is good because I actually have only a license to it. And I know these NFTs are just like autographed copies of a digital iBook that I don't own and the platform yeah. owns? What happens with there's, preservation? What happens with this? Well, there's two things. I'm gonna first address the first thing you said, which is a massive problem for my world, which is the gallery world where artists actually really care about how people interact with their work, right? Yeah. And right now that I would say that's almost been eliminated from the dialogue. There's, there's no indication of anybody caring about that. And that's a huge problem. And we, we will not stand for that at my gallery. We will continue hmm. to work with artists and collectors that, that want to have an emotional connection, want to in, you know, enrich their lives, which is what art is about. Yeah. What we're seeing yeah. with NFTs in the art world is not that. This is about, it, it's more of a trading card mentality. You, you're collecting. Hmm. He's very Which is a kind of collectible, yeah. And by the way, I think that will be a huge market. I, I don't well, deny that market, but there's a very different, you know, yeah. again, we've been doing this a long time, so we've worked really hard at how you experience digital art, right? Mm -hmm. and, and part of that now is, you know, how do you um, preserve it? And, you know, that it, it depends on what you're buying, right? If you're buying software, absolutely more complicated. Um, you're dealing with constant changes in operating systems, the speed of computers, et cetera. And, you know, there's different ways to deal with that. And it, it's, it's, it's a whole other. I mean, this gets to this very interesting cultural difference, which, which is, um, um, as you pointed out, People collect your work and put it on the wall, and it looks like with NFTs, people are just happy to have it and say they they have it. Um, there's also this value thing, which is like in in an NFT one, 
the the work is sitting out there publicly like the people i have the people on my wall but what's cool is a fund bought that one people so 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 i'm wondering to to what degree is this particular collecting phenomenon a bubble or a thing that will pass as the market gets broader both both at the prices and at some of the behavior level like uh, you well, know, think, are people going to buy these more for display, or are we in a new culture here? I think what a couple of people have brought up, and what Steve's hitting on, is there's not a Dewey Decimal System yet for NFTs, and there are solutions for that. Like we're building some projects right now with integrations with Open Index Protocol, for example, because mm -hmm. essentially that allows you to create a immutable. Doesn't matter if Ethereum goes down, Cardano goes down. Doesn't matter what you minted it on. There's a open index. So Google has the biggest index of information out there. That's why they're the monopoly they are. And they're never going to open it up. But in this world, when you mint something, you can actually create a in, immutable index record that also has in there the rules of space, the rules yeah. of streaming, the rules of ownership, the rules of access, the royalty mm. streams, the things. So when you think about what happens to Spotify down the road, no, they're not going to change their rules for three LAU or any, they're not going to do that for somebody. But if Taylor Swift all of a sudden decides to do a drop directly to her fans and she says Spotify can't have it unless they pay by these rules and it's a smart contracted thing on open index protocol, you might see a massive shift all of a sudden in the way streaming companies have to deal with art, right? And so at some point in the future, those kind of things well, can happen. Could it, is it fair to say though that I could imagine if I take what you just said, Chris, and what Steve just said, I can imagine that the smart contract enforces that if you don't actually have this resolution monitor in this, you know, four feet above the ground with oh this God. lighting situation, you can do anything you want and allow people to stand 12 feet back from it so that it actually gets the parallax view and the camera view. <laughs> Not it only won't that, show you up. Could, you could bundle it, you could bundle it, it with a up. ticket. Yeah, but you could bundle it with a gallery ticket that, that you can put onto a wearable watch that the minute you cross a geo, it registers and burns that token and now gives you access into the gallery at some, like you can put more okay. than just so a that, that's thing. an example. But I mean, I ask this because in a sense, if you think of how IMAX, you know, came out of nowhere and blow, blew the world away with its incredible thing, mm -hmm was they required you to build an IMAX theater before they would show an IMAX movie. You couldn't just watch an IMAX thing somewhere. The, the guy who be bought sitting in this crazy thing, right? Mickey, yeah. the irony here is you're the original guy who taught me about IoT devices that brick out their owners and how we want things yeah. open and repairable. And now we're saying an artist sells me something and if he doesn't like my taste in my walls, forget about it. I can't watch it. That's right. right? So that's what I'm saying. No, yeah. well, yeah, that's right. And it's funny because you, uh, Chris just mentioned the open internet or open index protocol. And of course, my last book, Trillions, was about building something that didn't rely on companies deciding to keep servers running like Google and the average half-life of a Fortune 100 company is 15 years, which means forever is a long time. And it was about how do you build basically massively peer-to-peer -peer distributed systems that scale to galaxies. And I don't see any of that happening yet at, at oh. all. Uh, well, instead, it is we're relying happening. on these kind of, oh, yeah. I mean, somewhere, yeah, hopefully. It's happening. Yeah, it's. I mean, and it's and it's yeah. real, and it's like oh, we're over. steeped in it, so we could go nerd yeah. out. Oh, Mohib's got a great comment. And then <clears throat> Agni Atska is tuned in online, an amazing yeah. artist in New York, a good friend of ours. Um, so Mohib mentions, you know, do you have to verify that you're, you are not Anish Kapoor if you download the NFT oh. of a color palette. You know, Anish, Anish Kapoor came up with that weird super phantom or black or whatever that was like blacker than black, that if you painted something with it, it would disappear. I mean, it didn't reflect anything. And and he got all, all fancy with his art world. And then Agnieszka says, could you talk a little bit about scarcity in the art work, world? And it re probably relates to in the music world as well and in the, in the you know, immersive audio world. How is that scarcity model playing out, you know, and, and that scarcity that is in the traditional model playing out, you know, in this world? And how might it play out? I'm, I think that's open to anybody. Yeah. Well, like I said earlier, I, I think the idea of having a, a unique token and contract connected to a unique digital file, that's what scarcity is. And it, it, it's, a, it's a huge deal for my world. Um, but what's interesting about the other comment is another concern of my artists. Um, I'm hearing a lot of artists say their works are being minted without their knowledge. Right. 
Right. So mm. this is this is a massive problem that's going to happen. Mm. There needs to be some type of um, verification. Can you say more about that? So like, like if an artist, th this is kind of like someone does a multiple, someone picks it up, starts printing it and selling it at the store and the artist has no idea. Like what exactly. we do, how that happens. Yeah. yeah, someone, I mean, not that I want to give anyone any ideas, but you go to my website or anybody's yeah. website, you, you can take that image and you can technically, <coughs> you know, things, because there's so much out there now, no one knows if it's the real artist. There's no there's no verification mm. process. And a lot of it is anonymous in many cases. That's why so, decentralized IDs is why hey, they matter. Well, that's that has to happen. Mm. Yeah. By the way, to this end, yeah, we were on I open I was at your gallery, we were in open sea the other night, and we saw all these auctions come up, and then we realized it was a bot. It was a bot that was picking up a still JPEG, They're animating it, putting it up, and literally every 13 minutes it started a new auction. It either did or didn't sell. But it was like it was like bot spam with art. Man, I, I feel like I gotta write that tonight. That's a great idea, Jesse. You looked like you were gonna say something. Well, yeah, it's similar with artists where the rules aren't written on how publishing works. Publishing in mechanical royalties and masters are such a complicated space that's been taking years to to draft up in terms of syncs. Like, what does this look like when you put music in an NFT or on the blockchain? People have not figured that out. So it's really tricky in the clearance department. Like, is this the same as like putting it in a movie or putting it in a television show? Ah, uh, yeah. There's 15 writers on a song. There's four producers on the song. There's a label that owns the master. And then there's all these creators that own the, the, the track component of it. Like, how does the clearances work? And so, Jesse, what about licensing? I mean, you know, because I, I remember... If we wanted to play a piece of music, you know, on a on a corporate video for something, you know, we had to go to go, you know, we had to go talk to the house to get it licensed properly. And we had to tell them how many copies would be made of the CD-ROM or something like that. Like, and, and of course, this happens in, mu in video games. You know, uh, w one of our mutual oh. friends that I met through Bonham, you know, made his money basically selling licensing rights of hip hop artists in video games, you know, so that. So they did it. What's happening in that world? I mean, is that being reset or what's? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's just literally figuring it out as they go and kind of like clenching their butts and hoping they're like they don't get in trouble or like <laughs> as far it can go. Like we're it's literally at the seat of our plants. And okay. even if you steal someone's music and you put it out, who do you sue? And how does a lawsuit look? There's no rules, there's no yeah. press, and, and it, there's room when it comes like to this, there's so much room for misappropriation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and well, and if you look at it though, the, there's a have and have not thing here though. Um, if you sing happy birthday on a YouTube song to your kid, you'll get an algorithmic takedown notice, an autonomous contract you know, <clears> will be sent to you from Google's lawyers, basically saying, I'm gonna <clears> remove <throat> that. But the lone artist does not have any ability to do that, and you know it's not like it's it's a dis it's a it's a it's a disproportionate thing. Yeah, you do. What were you saying? Figured it out, whereas this is not figured out. So how how would you even get a takedown? Mm. Yeah, and yeah. one thing I'm seeing a lot too is you know you have these audio visual collaborations happening between music artists and visual artists. And a lot of them aren't writing that down anywhere in a contract. So if that mm. does really well over the next 90 years, yeah. are they just going to be really good friends that are figuring out that exchange for that long? So my, well, I think oh, artists are, I, all these people are getting like a real wide wake up call about, about ideas and intellectual yeah. property in some ways. You know, I, I remember uh, Lawrence Lessig's book, The Future of Ideas, and it's a chilling book. You know, he was a, a clerk for the Supreme Court. And he really studied and worked with, you know, the Electronic Frontiers Foundation and others to really understand what an idea is and why do you want it to be, you know, uh, uh, an idea that goes back in the commons because art is about riffing on other people's ideas versus a piece of property, you know, rivalrous versus non-rivalrous property, right? If you if your cow eats all the grass, it's rivalrous. That's the Boston Commons, and that leads to the to the you know to the to the, the the depletion of the commons, 
but ideas, actually, it's good to put them back out in the world. You know, so John, it sounds like you've got something on this. You know, I, I was just thinking that this idea of, of being able to have enforcement, I mean, uh, uh, and Chris mentioned DIDs and permissions. You can have you you can have NFTs that have built-in permissions and triggers that that would revoke. I mean, there's a whole design space there, and they're doing. I but, mean, but to Sarah's point, they're not having that conversation now, and it's hard no, when no, suddenly I mean, something gets big, and then you got to go back to all your collaborators and go, uh, "Yeah, no, I'm going to keep all that." You know, when when I was starting companies, uh, you know, when we started a company with a founder, it was way easier to negotiate all the rules of the road before the company had any value. Because once it had value, holy crap, like people started digging their heels in. It was really complicated because, you know, we can't help it. I, I don't know. Yeah, they, hey, I, uh, the, all this stuff is going to get repriced at some point, right? And that's not a bad thing. It's just hmm. natural laws of physics. Yeah. And who knows? And so it's, it's hard to kind of, it's hard to not want to buy in and then, and, and just get to market with something, right? So that's what you see labels doing. You see a lot of people doing it and they're not wrong. At the end of the day though, if you're patient or if you kind of are really building this out and you're thinking long-term, you go, okay, what's my risk appetite for now and my need for now? Yeah. And then what am I gonna lose if I don't move? And at the same time, you're also thinking this whole place gets re repriced at some point and we can call it winter, we can call it whatever. It's not a bad thing. It means that yeah. there will be a there'll be a period of time where this work is going to get done and it's already been started, but it'll become relevant because there'll be some tipping point that says, Youch, right? And whether it's somebody getting robbed that shouldn't have or whatever. But um, you know, it's it's just the law of markets, right? So yeah. Jesse, and then I've got a question for everybody here on the creative futures of this. Jesse. The big promise that got everybody excited about the NFT space was the resale ability. The ability to write it into the smart contract and the creator was going to be able to see royalties off of the resales in perpetuity. And that was going to be the promise of what these are. Nobody has seen that yet. And it's just still like a vaporware promise of what it's coming and so all of the, how do you put legal into that when you think you're getting the resale for in perpetuity and that doesn't exist yet? So this whole space is like, what's happening now is so far ahead of where it is actually gonna be. And I think we're all just like in this world where it's exciting because we're home and because mm -hmm. uh, crypto's got a lot, there's a lot of crypto money on the side and there's needs to be use cases for it. And it's a really like, it's an exciting opportunity yeah, for time. But the truth of the matter is like, this is, this is not what the promise of where it's going is right. yet. And we've got to solve for abundance because scarcity has its value in collectibles. But what you're talking about is what I've been saying. It's just the real use case is when you can use NFTs for abundant things. Because that's when the world yeah. turns multiple times a day. That's when the math gets mm -hmm. real for artists, for creators. And, and then at the same time, you bundle scarcity with it, where now 500 of your fans can own three seconds of a master's, and the album doesn't drop until all of them are bought. And then it drops, and, and like you can do all these other shardings yeah. that, that never could happen So there are before. different ways to play with this. It's almost fungibility across uh, scarcity and abundance, right? Because there's a lot of talk. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, Diamantis right. and others right. about, you know, the right. rise of abundance, but it's actually about, you know, I know Jesse, a lot of the things you do with your artists and, and with your experiences, it's about the experience, right? It's like, were you there? Oh my gosh. Were and, you and there for that moment? And that's scarcity, and you know, and, right but now. yeah. We're there for the party. Yeah. We're there for the party because it's too soon. Like it's, it's it hasn't happened yet where it's really going. So like what's happening yeah. in the artist world is they're coming to the people that are doing it are just coming to the table and saying, let's have some fun with this space and see what happens. And yeah. it's working. There's a lot out. of play right now, which is nice. It's, it's fun to see. Sarah, did you have something you wanted to say? Oh, go ahead, Sarah. And then I got a question. Um, I guess what I was just going to say is I do, I don't see it going away anytime soon. I mean, coming from the immersive tech distribution space with media, I just see NFTs as kind of the opening to allow for that, those transactions to happen on the blockchain. Hmm. Um, 
I have a question on the creative frontier of all of this. In a way, for all of this excitement, actual NFTs have had a very narrow dynamic range. We've said they're, they're JPEGs, they're short video clips, and they're a song. And the world has much more of that to it than that. So, for example, John, you and I have talked about the fact that an architect might render, you know, what we call a CAD drawing. But if you get that, you suddenly would get the right to, if you had a programmable space, you know, shipping containers or movable walls, you're almost buying a living blueprint that can program your space. And so there's a creative relationship between what the artist does and how space dynamically change. That, that, and, you know, all we've seen so far in NFTs in space are things that look like, uh, you know, Second Life buildings. Can you talk a little bit about that idea? Well, right. I, I, I think, uh, yeah, we're, we're exploring that idea in terms of, um, uh, well, at MIT, they, they, they spun out a company called Ori that does programmable spaces and recombinant spaces. And, and if so part of what you want to do is design an experience within a space. And and part of is this the, Eve Bahar's kind of robotic what? space or whatever. Is this Eve Bahar, who's the the designer, the no, Ori? This, I was. This is a company, but it's, it's an extension of that. There, there, there. You can actually decide how you want to live together communally. You want to have whether it's a it's a workspace, a living space, an income space. You can have different kinds of exhibits. You can have different kinds of kitchens. So it, 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 it looks at how you live as something being a, a plastic thing that you can then yeah. give expression to. And then that people can then, there may be living, living experience is a, is, a, is a kind of art. And then can you validate that with an NFT? And can you then yeah. say that? Uh, that By the way, can, so John, is, is Ori, that is Eve Bahar's Fuse Project, the, the designer, so he's sort of famous for being a famous designer. It's kind of like Kim Kardashian of the design world. So he's he's doing this Ori thing. Are they actually looking at NFTs as a means of like having custom experiences inside of a space? Like, well, like well, if what, I buy this experience like curated by Spike Lee, then when I come home at night, the room and the feeling and the music is all gonna be, you know, kind of brought exactly, to you right. by Spike exactly Lee the way he, he curates a magazine exactly. or something. It's an integrated it's an integrated thing. And but it, it also could be you could also do it in a, in a reduce the carbon imprint. You could actually do something that is is by virtue of designing that way actually generates uh, it reduces the carbon footprint. Um so well, you can you can achieve certain other kind of objectives with this. It's it's well, yeah, the carbon thing, you're making me think, John, about, you know, the carbon thing, another use case we haven't touched on because it's a whole other rabbit hole is fashion, right? So, you know, direct to avatar last year was $66 billion in, in market. That, that was bigger than the economy of Bulgaria. And, <laughs> Wait, and that's what is direct to avatar, by the way, just I think direct to consumer, but selling stuff to my avatar. So I can now, oh, with so it's, like it's virtual whatever, wear. Right. So okay. it's, it's real life clothes that are for my avatar. So imagine now I have all these personas. I have my gamer persona. I have my wait, wait, persona. Chris, tell me more about this off afterwards, because, you know, I make so many good customs. And I yeah, feel so like they're just the, wasted The reality is you can reality. use an NFT, right? You can use an <laughs> NFT and they can go something and get a clo file, a CLO file or use fabricant. And you can I create feel like New York should be all over this, real life you know, just because clothes. of her outfits. Yeah. yeah, real life clothes that your avatar or your video game skin Direct can wear that you own. That's avatar. right. And so this is look, these are all <laughs> examples of things between the digital and the physical interface that are possible, right? We've thought of creating like you know, digital architecture stuff, but Ori and Kent Larson and Eve say no, it could become real. And now we're doing the same thing with. Look, it's so much of online value started with building stuff for games, right? That's where kind of Bitcoin came out of all this crap for games. So that's a really interesting thing we're seeing. I want to throw another interesting one on the table. I was talking to Agnesh Kapilat earlier, who's put some comments up here. She's uh, also the artist in residence at Boston Dynamics. They make the robots that look like dogs. Oh, oh, so now the wow. question came, what does it mean to do a piece of art there? Well, the latest thing for the dog is it has a robotic arm. So now... You have painting. Well, you know, Steve, ever since we've, um, uh, who was the first person to, the um, it's created the, Salawit. Ever since Salawit, you would write the instructions down and something mm -hmm. would start painting. She's been looking at that. But now another thing that the robot does is the robot has machine vision. That's basically so that it can figure out what's there. 
They don't expose that. But if you were to look at that file, it looks a little bit like pointillism. So you have you have one view of the world, which is the, the machine vision view. You have another is how an artist might, you know, the way one with gouache on paper might take an outline and create something with it. Calder would do things like that. So now they're looking at how do these two expressions come out, right? That could be an interesting uh, <laughs> NFT uh, style project. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think there's a, we're on the point of des uh, designing digital life forms. That, 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 that's that's and, what I was going to add. They can model each other. I mean, I, you know, I'm very much in, in, interested in this work of, of Carl Friston and sort of the uh, Bayesian mechanics and next generation AI, where you have models of other things and, I, and and they make models of one another. They evolve models. And so you have these, these. I mean, it's sort of like the next generation crypto kitties. I mean, you're creating new kind of species that have certain characteristics. John, you should have been on, on our episode like two weeks ago, a week ago, when we had um, Josh Baumgart and Michael Levin showing off um, evolutionary algorithms in supercomputers I, for exactly. frog muscle cells that then they actually, they built for real and the frog muscle cells were actually able, heart muscle cells, were able to actually clean uh, capillaries and actually help down at micro levels, they were virtual life forms that were first bred in supercomputer uh, evolutionary game of lives, and then they what were actually it? made in the real world. These are called xenobots. Yeah, he's xenobots. Are, he won a he won a, a design award in a, for for the xenobots. Um, the green psycho. The green yeah. piece is what I was going to say. Sorry, the social impact is I don't I have fast fashion without the glut of the green. Uh, without without the cost of what's happening with <laughs> jeans and things, right? Because my avatar can buy sure. more clothes without having the negative economic impacts or yeah. the negative earth impacts. And at the same and it's time, it's fair to say that clothing is one of the most destructive. I wear a black T-shirt, but my avatar's got fifty suits. Manufacturing processes <laughs> right? on the planet. I mean, it's such a chemical hell, and yeah. most so, of it, you know, yeah. So Martin, so you haven't waited in a while. I'm, and then the last piece I was going to say on the humanitarian side, and then I'll shut up. I promise was. Replica, which creates real life looking avatars. I mean, you can't tell the difference. Replica with a K out of the Netherlands yeah, won, um, won nine can lions like last year. Service in some weird, yeah. Because what they did was they, they created a 10 year old, lifelike looking Filipino girl, but she was an avatar. She doesn't exist. She was an NFT. And they caught 10,000 pedophiles who sent her an email yeah. without putting a human at risk. Wow. And, and so these are some of the other social impact things where when you think about NFTs and you think about stuff that we're not thinking about that have art, but mm. also are just using design, we're, 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 we're stepping into a whole new world of, of, but, just, but there is interesting time. Hey, Martin, you have been watching for a very long time <laughs> and you are also a master maker and creator and deployer. I'm wondering how you're reacting to all this. No. Well, Again, I'm very fascinated with how what this means to to better deal with our relationship with nature. So, in in many ways, a lot of what John was saying in terms of digital life forms is, is a key ingredient of, that we need to be able to create digital twins of nature so that we be we're able to model them and factor them in into our our whole economics. Um, nature is not fungible in many ways, and natural capital could probably be best represented through NFTs. And it's also hmm. very interesting, the mindset shift that this is all bringing. And I, I, I really like the comment on hmm. scarcity. Our economics have shaped us to value tangible and scarce things, but there are so many valuable things in, a, in our world that are, that are abundant. And whilst the art piece is unique, the entire art and the entire creative space is abundant. And so if we're able to create this abundant value minting um, connection, mm. it might be able to help us address some of the things of how do we also understand the value of nature and preserve it. So Martin, this this makes me think of, you know, I know your work is in, in a sense this, you know, when you mentioned the digital twins, and I know John and Kent Larson at MIT City Science Lab have been doing this, um, it's that notion of if we had a digital stunt double, not necessarily a digital twin, but think of like, you know, Brad Pitt to Matt Damon or something or, or whatever in, in some movie where where you pull the, the other one in and then they get the beat, the punch in the face, and then you, you bring in the pretty boy again. If we had a digital stunt double for the earth so that we weren't yeah. actually destroying the earth with every damn experiment we had in scarcity yeah. or speculation, 
but we just destroyed this sort of one of a billion possible Earths. Yeah. Could we learn I, how to actually take care of the Earth better? <laughs> you know, absolutely. because I think exactly. we, you mentioned it's not fungible. There's only one forest in this galaxy that we've been able to discover, and it's on this planet. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and, absolutely. You know, and this is thanks to the work of artists and the carbon drop. That's that's our next huge project is, is to go deep into mm. the digital twin of planet Earth to model a lot of this mm. because time is of the essence. At the rate that we're going in seven years, we could bust out our carbon budget in our atmosphere. And that's just irreversible, uh, you know, four and a half billion yeah. years of history. So everything that we yeah. do in our strategy also needs to be modeled. And so a lot of the, you know, when we when we take what, how we think DIDing uh, everything to, to, to better connect uh, connectivity and repairability, and we simulate it through agent-based modeling, we can run different scenarios. And that kind of connects also with like Bucky's world game and, and say, how do yeah. we win this game? And how do we, and yeah. what are all the, 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 the pathways where we don't? And if, and if, you know, one of the biggest tipping points that we have in the next coming years, also a mission very really important for us, is how do we, how do we save the entire Amazon? You know, that, that is something that we're also just a couple of years ahead uh, away for, for closing that tipping point. We've lost coral reefs in, in, from, from, a, from a climate standpoint. We've lost, lost the Arctic. And this is happening within our lifetime. So now we have like things like how do we ensure that we can drive value um, to the Amazon? If we start looking at it, it's priceless. But if we, if we want to think about what does it take economically to stop the deforestation, it, it, some of the calculations are around a trillion. And if we think about you know, what the US is doing for COVID, that's nothing. It's the value of the Amazon is just absolutely um, priceless. Yeah. So if, if there was something that we could do through creating a digital twin, being able to monitor all that, yeah. that is something we need to do now. The power of creators now being able to donors, the philanthropic industry are, are everyone that has creative capacity. That is fascinating. In this whole conversation yeah. we've had today, We've talked about uh, NFTs in the in the digital art world as JPEGs or images, but we haven't really touched on operating program simulations. We've talked about sound. And, and Martin, what you've just brought out is the incredible value of a living simulation that lets you do thousands of hundreds of thousands, millions of iterations of the Amazon, what will work out, the Bucky game, what won't work. And that's also related to then the economics that support that. And what's interesting about this is we do have incredibly sophisticated simulations. We've had the chief of AI of Unity on, and we've had people from Epic on. Those gaming platforms seem like they can be useful in this kind yeah. of simulation thing. And we haven't even talked about NFTs and collecting as a, in, in a gaming environment, which is a simulation related to the environment. Sure. That could be very interesting. Mm. Well, yeah. That sounds related yeah, to what no, Sarah's no, done well, in the past. And yeah. Well, I, I, this, hmm. I think I wanted to add something that's very perfect from, from before. If we think about how well designed Bitcoin was to achieve what it is, we're going to say, well, that was great, but it was also poorly designed. It did not factor in the scale. And if, if Satoshi would have run some agent-based modeling, we'd be like, oh my God, this is going to consume a lot of energy. These are the type of things that we need to, before we roll out models and business models and factoring economic thinking into something that gets that's leashed, it, this is where a lot of those things have to have to be tested, um, and uh, and absolutely, the game engines have produced the raw material for us to be able to run what what I think is is the tools for Earth system governance and Earth system management, which in many ways Earth is just beyond governance. boundaries. Yeah. So, and, and Danny Lang, who joined us, who's the head of AI at Unity, he said that BMW is using uh, Unity engines and the physics of the physical world in the Unity engines because it has physics to actually spawn 10,000 Unity servers to run faster than real time, to run simulations of autonomous vehicles and the agents yeah. like a mom and you know pushing her kid and people at, at crosswalks so that they can get more training data using what's called you know synthetic generated training data than any car on the planet could get over 10,000 actual years. And they're doing it in a few months. And so, I mean, I do think we have to be taking this seriously. The, the catch, I would say, and, and you know, it's probably a whole nother show, is that the rate at which things are changing, you just mentioned it, 
is accelerating because of recombinomics of technologies. We're taking Bitcoin on top of you know something invented in the 30s on top of something invented, whatever. This is a natural part of the nature of technology is recombinomics, fractal, fractal vascularization, structural deepening, all that's the way it works. We know this from nature, but we have this acceleration, but our tools for modeling the future and the tools for modeling this are not going as fast. I mean, City Science, Martin, you know, John, your work, they're not moving as fast. And pretty soon we're going to be like batting balls out of our faces because, because the pace of change is going faster. The sort of, you know, Moore's law of physical change and, and, and climate change is moving much faster than the, the, I don't see many popular tools for modeling systems of systems of systems of systems that might be social, economic, cultural, uh, uh, you know, environmental. They're pretty baby steps. I mean, we're using 1990s or 1970s modeling yeah. approaches for well, 21st and, and century the, problems. Well, and you, you the, think about- It's also good. So go ahead. I, I was just gonna, I, I, I want to let you go too. I, I was gonna pick up on Mickey's thing because you think about another unsaid use of NFTs and it's the biggest value and the biggest thing at risk that we lose, which is everything we've learned for the last 10,000 years through research doesn't fit the algorithmic model of web two. So cat videos outrank it and swarm and hive models of decentralized storage ensure that the 404 unfound record happens for the reference in John's last research paper because only 180 people cared about it, but um, 2 million people cared about the cat video, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is where the open index protocol stuff and some of those other efforts to help us preserve knowledge, because we used to argue over opinions about facts. Now we argue over the facts themselves. <laughs> And none of us know whether COVID's a threat or it's not, or if it's a scam or it's not, right? And, and we don't know if NFTs are actually ruining the universe or helping it because none of us can figure out where the facts are. So as a social impact, as another use case of NFTs that's important is how research institutions and universities, as they downsize because of a post-COVID reality and their budgets are slashed, like Wyoming's budget got slashed 40% or whatever, right? And then other places have these unused capacities because this grant didn't get redone, but they have the infrastructure. They could use things like Chia, which is a proof of space and time. Bram Cohen from Bitcoin just went mainnet with that. Hmm. They could use those things to create this edge network replacement for Amazon. But universities could actually donate that space and time and earn through like labs currency for, for doing things. it while they are being part yeah, of a, a research stabilization network and, and NFTing all the research. So there's other use cases in the research world and in the university world where mm. you can take these tokenomics, you can take these more mm. green and friendly infrastructures, the Bitcoin 2.0 kind of decentralized blockchain and things like Chia, and you could start to put them into the real world and solve regular economic problems for universities while at the same time mm. using NFTs to preserve our most precious knowledge and things like open index protocol to make sure we can find it. So there's a lot of really so, cool stuff when you start nerding out about that. When you, yeah. So there's probably a whole, we know there have got to be future episodes on all this stuff. Martin, you look like you had something to say. And I, I want to also just make sure everyone gets a chance to have a Friday night because I know it's getting late. And <laughs> as always, we've gone right into the overtime. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just thinking, I was just going to add, uh, I think Chris talked talk, touched a bit of it, is we also have to invest in those simulation models and we have to understand why they're so relevant. Uh, when we sent our letter to all of our artists at the carbon drop of what was the use of proceeds, it's, it's one of the main projects that we have, which is how do we improve the mechanisms and the tools to manage the Paris Agreement? Right now, it's, it's basically countries sending Excel spreadsheets to the UN and PDF files. Yeah. And, yeah. and so... It, 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 in the policy world, in the supranational policy world, a lot of the tech world is, is missing. It's just totally blind. These, these sectors are not talking to each other. Um, so th those simulations are very important for us to, to also inform policy, also work with policymakers uh, to say what you want to negotiate, because one of the main things we need to negotiate this year in, in Glasgow at COP26 is how do we deal with carbon markets? Is how do we address double counting, which is a very important part. We, just, we also talk about the problem about double counting in, in art. Um, uh, in the climate space, that's 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 the heart of it. Um, oh yeah, countries well. just send a spreadsheet and say this is how many you know tuna we fished, but we're a fishing nation, so we're just gonna like change the numbers on the spreadsheet because who the hell can check? Because it's yeah. the it's the planet, and and we know this is happening today, and and it's it is a big topic for COP twenty six at the end of the year. Um, well. Uh, Everybody, this has been delightful, and thank you for jumping in at pretty
pretty much the last I minute is the good way we work, way to I end guess. up with everybody. <laughs> um, the good way to end up is I here's I've got a question. Here we are. We've just entered the first quarter of 2021. It's April 2nd. We have nine months to go in mm -hmm. this year. Um, we already know we're in a year where we experience a year every few weeks. So I'm just wondering what we might see in this space in the rest of the year. Perhaps, Sarah and Jesse, starting with you, in the music industry, you already alluded to the fact that it's coming back strong and Sarah, spatial audio is having its birth. What can we expect between mm -hmm. now and the end of Christmas? I'll just say I, I'm looking into partnerships with when live music comes back online and what that looks like for music NFTs and how the two worlds can combine in an easier way. And I think a conversation I'm not really hearing talked about is that, you know, cannabis is being legalized in many states. It just was in, in New York. Uh, here I am in Northern California, Humboldt County. Uh, in 2019, they had the first music festival to ever have legalized cannabis sales. So I'm also keeping that in mind as I'm building out these environments for music NFTs and thinking about how people are going to be interacting with them now that they're just not lining up at a bar uh, once they enter the festival. So I think that's another component uh, to live music as it's opening up. Jesse? I think we're going to see the important part for these NFTs to grow is where you can experience them, where you can share them, where you can see them. So I feel like there's going to be more environments to experience, to see the museum of NFT, just like the museum of ice cream or inside of the MoMA NFTs, world premieres of music, somebody can own it. And once you can experience it in this physical environment, that's when all of a sudden it'll click, it'll make sense and it'll reach mass market. And I think that that's when, the actual content of the music and the NFT will change. And that'll be the whole world will move when all of a sudden there's new places to experience NFT music. Can you hear, can you see them on SoundCloud? Can you hear them on Spotify? There's not enough environments to be able to experience NFTs. So I think that's gonna be hmm. the, the the kind of where we'll start to see the medium. And shift. Jesse, you pointed out that in this year where we've been deprived of real world experiences and we've been ultra virtual <clears throat> when we come roaring back to real world immersive experiences that'll be a thing um as you may know i'm a chairman and co-founder of gray area which is an art and technology center in san francisco and we were deeply focused on place-based immersive media because we felt there's something anesthetizing about putting on a VR headset. There's something amazing about being in space with all of this stuff. So right. there's so much that can be explored here, especially with this new mechanism. So much to follow up on here. Great. Steve, um, the end of your year is kind of marked by uh, Art Basel in, 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 in uh, Miami. Florida, in Miami. Um what do you see for the rest of the year kind of in the art world and in how these relationships are developing and what we can look forward to, say, in Miami in December? It's a very good question. Um, yeah, I have not been to an art fair in, in <laughs> over a year. And I don't know how many people know, but art fairs are a pretty big part of, of my business. And those connections to people, you know, having the artists there, seeing the work physically. Um, I'm hoping that comes back, but I do think I, I can guarantee you, at least I know my gallery will in Basel, we will have some connection to, um, you know, an audience that will understand NFTs and appreciate um, this new, <laughs> this new world that, that has been developed. So it we, is the excitement that we're seeing perhaps because we're in San Francisco or we're in the tech world around NFTs. Now, is that going to be a big feature by the time we get out to Miami or will NFTs just be a thing? And there's a whole bunch of collectors doing everything. Well, as I said earlier, I think it's about um, at least on the gallery art world side, I think it's about a higher level of curation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this other market, which is again, more of a, a flipping market will, will continue. Right. But again, anyone dealing with digitally native work, um, I think will will try to use an NFT to create more confidence in the collectors that are out there. I mean, it's, it's just that simple. Um, but mm. yeah, I, I'm just hoping for the sake of my artists and the art world that 
you know, people, the physical interaction, you know, starts to happen again. And Martin, um, you pioneered something really in the last few weeks with, with Carbon Drop in the relationship between artists, causes, and, and this NFT world. What, what do you imagine the next, the rest of the year holds in this arena? Yeah, I really think this is the, the the beginning and I've kind of drafted a bit my thesis of like a lot of how these technologies that are disrupting different industries are music being being the newest ones. Um, it has a very important role to play on how do we how do we better manage nature, but also because it's it's empowering a lot of the artists, we're going to see a lot more of, of that connection between the creators and their social and environmental impact causes that they care and how this can, can bridge a lot of that economic. And you don't think the excite the hype will run out, and you know, like by the time we get out of December, there won't be fun for this. That this. Well, I think the, I think the prices will adjust, but 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 the total sector will keep growing. Yeah, good. In the individual prices, but that would that would be a fast guess. And Chris, you're always doing very practical uh, kind of new entrepreneurial things. You've done a lot of events and things. What does the calendar for the balance of the year look like in your world? Well, uh, so I, I you know I I know what we're going to kind of roadmap to over the next nine months. So what you'll see is I think you'll see about 157,000 or in change people with decentralized IDs, um, reinventing influencer business models, street teams, and taking to market um, products and things that make sense and that, you know, kind of create a use case. I also think we'll be doing that inside of tailwinds and headwinds where um, there will be a bastardization, if there isn't already, of the word NFT and um, the typical things that come with that. And there'll likely be some kind of you know, major, major scam slash, uh, you know, consumer protectionism demand between now and the end of the year. I, I, I'm not calling it a bubble burst. I'm saying you just can't have this much froth and not have the hustlers come in if they're not already in. And so I think that I think between now and the end of the year, we're going to have this juxtaposition of hopefully some really amazing cross vertical use cases that show NFTs are not one dimensional. They're not even three dimensional, right? These are four dimensional, multi-dimensional things. And that there's a lot of different applications and needs that have social impact across all levels. And also they're very fun and they're going to re-energize industries that have been in the dark ages for 30 years, subject to a CPM model. And at the same time, I think regulators are going to have an example mm. as they regulate other cryptos to maybe overreach and start mm. trying to regulate NFTs in a way that is problematic and probably limited and in, in foresight. And so we're going to have to resist that because there will be a, there will be some kind of crisis in my humble opinion that gives people that want to kill innovation, a reason to get reelected. And so ignorance is going to be a problem and um, enlightenment is an opportunity. Thank you. And John as quarantine's yes. resident futurist, Asking you to comment on just the nine months is a little bit like asking Columbus to only discover a river nearby because you look at a broader swap, but uh, kind of. Well, I, I think in the near term, I think there's really good points here. Yes, there's a lot of froth and, and speculation, but I think what that'll do is focus on the curation of the whole uh, and the value curation and the next generation NFTs around that. One thing we did not talk about that I think is a part of this, and there's a there's a whole another movement is how do you create there are sort of a special economic zones, virtual economic zones that perform in a certain way. Um, that you how do you create these communities? How do you fund have self funding networks that in, in, in encompass certain values? And I and I think NFT is going to play a role in that. And this whole notion of community and how to solidify a community and how to be able that the community be self-financing, self-articulating, self-evolving will be something that will come out at the end of the year. Good. Um, I think we heard from everybody. I believe we heard from everybody. It's <laughs> a large right, group. Right. All right. Um, we could definitely go in for hours. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Okay, great, uh, we will good. Thank you. This conversation. Uh, the, the, we, we, I want to. I want to. I want to also congratulate us. I've just received word we are the only, the first, the only NFT con, and there have been many NFT conversations in the last month that did not bring up Beeple and seventy million. We are unique. 
in that respect, and we must be. Wait, wait, you just did it. We almost did it. <laughs> it's so true. Uh, <laughs> exactly. I did um, like Survival Research Lab. I saw that little thing at the, the bottom. Eight? If anyone knows who they are, that was fun. They're great, um, and they want they want a Boston Dynamics dog to mess with, which I think would be great. Yeah. How about uh, the eighty-five dollars? I'm so afraid. <laughs> and by the way, yeah. um, for all I, of you, there's so much. <laughs> I mentioned gray area. Uh, if you want to bring this up, uh, Mohib, uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. Can go. you bring up the page? If you could bring up that web page. Uh, gray area is about to start a series of uh, workshops and workshops classes on NFTs class. because we, it's it's basically an opportunity to to train our to to, to provide training to our artist world to and also artists, to start getting yeah. into the some of the conversations here. Around um, around some of the ethical issues, the inclusion issues. How do we scale this connection between nonprofits? So if you go to the gray area uh, site, there's an ongoing set of workshops, and that's going to be followed by uh, a bunch of stuff being created by by our artist community. and And Martin, we hope to collaborate with you on some of that stuff. Okay, um, Mickey. Thank you, everybody. I, you want to tell us gotta, about next week's? Sh thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll see everybody. next Thank you, show. everybody. Yeah, let's yeah. let's yeah. say goodbye to everybody, well, and I'll try to everybody. Next week. Bye, 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 bye. All right. So next week uh, is Wonder. So we're going to talk about Wonder, a brand new book coming out about Mister Rogers' Neighborhood by Greg Beer, who runs the Grable Foundation and the, and the Remake Learning Initiative, the sort of kids and creativity movement. Uh, that comes out of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, uh, has just launched a new book. It's coming on April 20th. And next Friday, he's going to be on. We're going to have some from the STEAM Lab at Smithsonian, who actually helps kids learn about wonder by making things. And then we're going to have somebody from Autodesk who actually, this, this last week, Tinkercad is 10 years old. And it's used by hundreds of thousands, millions of kids, students, teachers to actually build tangible things, whether it's code blocks and building wood or whether it's 3D objects or whether it's you know robotic things and stuff like that. And so we'll have uh, someone joining us from, from the Tinkercad world to talk about how do we help the next generation learn how to make the world they wanna make. And it's gonna be pretty exciting. And then we've got a 15 year old maker who, 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 who fell in love with just building things and making things. And he's actually started a whole green, uh, uh, like a garden supply where at 15, he's actually helping people learn how to actually have a green thumb. And so he's making his whole community better. And that'll next, next week, that's all about wonder. How do we cover wonder? And so I'm super excited about that episode. And of course it helps we can recommend a weird book. So we just talked about a lot of crypto things. So I would say Cryptonomicon should be on your list. Uh, if you've had a chance, you'll learn how to do uh, a, a one-time a one-time key in a prison if you need it. You'll learn about phone breaking uh, and learn about the creation of the first digital bank in 1999, as well as how, uh, how all that gold got stolen during World War II. So very exciting, and it'll teach you a little bit about cryptography all the way back to the original Cryptonomicon from centuries ago. What, what an Peter, what time is it? calendar. Um, and by the way, we should remind people that uh, you have been tuned into the Easter show here at Quarantine. Easter, as you know, is a celebration Today of is Good Friday. Good Friday, and, and, and in celebration of Easter's resurrection sensibility, it has been the resurrection of crypto this year and in many ways it a is. second coming of how tokens apply to the world. And so we're glad to make that connection. Mick, uh, is it time for me to look at the clock? Yeah, what time is it? Right now it's 6.04 Pacific Quarantine. That's a long a episode. <laughs> yeah, it's a long Have episode. Have a good weekend, everybody. Yeah. Oh, and Mohib, that's your cue to run the... Let's get close, but not so close.